Get your anyone but Biden 24 merch at studosmerch.com. Use the code Stu10. You'll save 10%. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video right now, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell for notifications. We appreciate when you do that. Josh Hammer is going to be here in a little bit to give us his take on the insane situation in the Middle East. RFK Jr. is making some surprising moves in his presidential campaign. We'll get to that as well. But the big news today, we're going to start by doing the attack on Israel. Um, I started hearing about this this weekend, and I don't know, I feel like maybe I'm like you. When I saw these alerts, I thought to myself, you know, I've seen this a million times, right? The rockets are flying from Hamas. Like, you kind of, uh, you feel for the people of Israel, but we've seen it so many times that I didn't really react all that dramatically. I don't know if you were the same way. Maybe I'm just evil. But as we learn more and more and more and more about what was going on, it was much, much worse, much worse than anything we had seen. Uh, hundreds of people are dead. Hundreds are kidnapped. It is a terrible situation. Let me give you some of the footage here just to set the scene. Uh, some body cam footage of Hamas terrorists uh, has been leaked online. Let's watch some of that. Um, you can see them. Yeah, good chant there, buddy. Uh, you can see the hole in the wall. They're sneaking through the wall. I'm not sure how they were able to blur their faces out. High technology, apparently, with Hamas. Uh, got through the fencing here. Cut through fences. Cut through walls. And this is something we've talked about for a while, even on the border. Walls do 80% of the job. Walls do not do 100% of the job. They will never do 100% of the job. And you see they're walking through these uh, areas, and many of them are completely unoccupied. But they're shooting people. I mean, it is gruesome. And some of the stuff we could show you is even worse. Uh, of course, Iran then went to a military uh, parade and had uh, some stuff to say to their people. It's wonderful. We have come here to tell uh, the elder Khomeini that Israel will be erased from the face of the earth. Death to Israel. If the officials of the Zionist regime make a mistake, the Islamic Republic will raise Tel Aviv and Haifa to the ground on and on and on and on. Of course, Memory TV, who we've been talking about, I don't know, since 2005 or six. I mean, way, way back from the CNN headline news days, do an incredible job of watching all this trash on Middle Eastern TV and translating the parts that you need to hear. Uh, here is one of their uh, pieces. Uh, this is a, a Hamas commander calling for even more attacks. Nida says this is a call to our resistance, to our West Bank, to our people, to our resistance abroad, to our strategic allies, to all the sons of this nation. Today is your day. We are on the verge of victory. Eh, not really. That's, that's me adding that part. Uh, let us be partners in creating this great victory, inshallah. In conclusion, we say to the enemy that is making threats and going on rampage. Are they the ones going on rampage, really? Your threats, rampage, and arrogance did not and will not help you. It's a beautiful language. We say one thing, get out of our land, get out of our faces. Get out of our Jerusalem and out of our Al-Aqsa Mosque. We do not want to see you on this land. Where do you want to see them? Anywhere? This land is ours. Jerusalem is ours. And everything is ours. So they don't want to see, you don't want to see them on their land and all land is yours. So that gives a, good, a lot of good options there for the Jews uh, in that particular scenario. Uh, we even saw a kidnapping. I mean, there was tons of kidnappings that went on. They came through these fences. They attacked this music festival. They went all over the place, shooting people randomly. Hundreds of people just at the music festival uh, were found dead, many kidnapped. This is one woman who's being kidnapped right in front of our eyes. Um, here it is. As she goes into the, taken to the back of a car. She uh, looks to be in a lot of pain, assaulted in God only knows how many ways that we don't want to know about. And they stuff her in a car. Over and over and over again, uh, this, uh, this scene kind of played out all over Israel. Absolutely incredible. And you'd think, you know, everyone would be reacting with horror. And we have seen a decent amount of that. People are upset about this. But uh, I haven't seen much from really our White House. We'll get into their reaction in a minute. 
And you might say, well, okay, uh, maybe you're an isolationist. Maybe you're, you know, strict hands off in the world stage. Okay, you don't want anyone commenting on anything. Well, do you care if Americans died? Because I, that could be a line for some people, I would think. For me, I don't like when anyone dies. I'm kind of, a, you know, exception of maybe like I don't know, Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of people dying. Um, and this situation has escalated, at least you'd think it would, from the American perspective. At least nine Americans have been killed in these attacks. Nine Americans. That's a big deal. And of course, there are many more that are missing. That number is going to go up. The number is going to go up for Israelis. And, uh, you know, you'd think it's going to go up for people in the, the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip as well, as this is going to get very, very ugly, very fast for them on the other side of this. Uh, now, that's exactly how it should be. 100%. Uh, here is the UN ambassador uh, uh, for Israel talking about how, and I would say to this finally, how finally the era of reasoning is over. Economic incentives cannot change genocidal ideologies. I repeat, economic incentives cannot change genocidal ideologies. Fact check. It true. couldn't have worked with ISIS. It couldn't have worked with Al Qaeda. And it doesn't work with Hamas. The era of reasoning with these savages is over. Over. Now is the time to obliterate Hamas's terror infrastructure, to completely erase it, so that such horrors are never committed again. Now, the Israeli defense minister has ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. Uh, that is going on uh, as we speak, and it's going to escalate quite a bit. The amount of planning that it went into this uh, whole attack is really insane. Um, we're talking about launching rockets as a diversion, basically. Uh, apparently a couple thousand of them as a diversion tactic while they went to the walls, broke down the walls with bulldozers, went over the walls with paragliders. I mean, uh, can we check Amazon orders? How did they get all these things? Um, somehow they were able to get all this crap and then they were just landing in the middle of areas and just shooting everybody around them. I mean, it's absolutely disgusting. And you have to wonder how did Israel and honestly also the United States miss this sort of intelligence. Uh, you know, we're talking about a coordinated effort of thousands of people that must have taken a long time. Wall Street Journal has an exclusive today. Iran helped pl plan the attack on Israel over several weeks. The uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard gave the final go-ahead last Monday in Beirut. And how did they get away with this? How does... Iran get away with doing this when they're so publicly taking responsibility for this. I, it's hard to imagine that Israel stops and says, OK, we'll get rid of Gaza. Uh, we'll kill a bunch of terrorists in Gaza and let everything go back to normal. That can't be the answer here. We're going to go with uh, Josh Hammer in a little bit to talk about what should be the next answer. Um, now, the media itself, generally speaking, if I'm going to generalize on the media reaction to this, it's been OK. I mean, most of the time. Uh, the reaction has been generally, you know, sufficiently outraged at uh, what has happened here. Uh, it's maybe better than I would have expected. I did see a New York Times headline or a picture that with the buildings completely destroyed and, and they said the buildings were damaged by rocket attacks. Eh, a little more than damage. You know, it's not just a crack in the wall. Uh, it's not just floorboards misaligned. These were entire buildings collapsing on, on top of the people that were in them. That's a little bit of a bigger situation to me. Uh, but generally speaking, the media hasn't been horrible. And you wonder, though, how long this lasts, because what usually happens in these situations is when you have a horror show like what happened to the people in Israel, the media will, OK, I'll go along with this. I will say it's bad as well. However, you get a little bit down the road when Israel is responding for something they absolutely have to respond for. Uh, then you get a situation where uh, the media gets a little uh, fidgety and all of a sudden they start seeing the other side of the argument. They start doing a both sides thing over and over again. And we did see some of that, unfortunately, already. MSNBC, of course, leading the way, as you might expect. Uh, a host, Ayman Mohayadin, whoever that is, and I know you're going to be shocked to say she wasn't on Israel's side on this one. Uh, here she is blabbing about nonsense. 
The Prime Minister of Israel, the most oh, right wing in its uh, history, the most far right extremist point. Jewish nationalist, Jewish supremacist government that has existed in Jewish Israel supremacist. has been over the past. By, by law, you're not characterizing, by I, I, the way. That's I, actually what they've written just, into their That is just oh, like factually, factually, you know what I mean? Let me cover um, the for rhetoric you real that quick. has come out from Israeli politicians towards the Palestinians in the West Bank over the past several months has been vile, has been disgusting. It's not necessarily new, but it has become more prominent. If Israel decides to invade the Gaza Strip, the, the mobilization, if you will, of that country in order to reclaim the territory without a strategic objective, which is w what are you going to do? Are you going to reoccupy the Gaza Strip, repopulate it with uh, settlements? Are you going in there to try and kill every Hamas leader? Um, they've been doing uh, yeah. that for years, and that hasn't changed. And they, they, they're able they, to they actually effectively do that. They've yeah. assassinated the most senior uh, leaders of Hamas's political wing, its military wings, low-level people. They've been able to do all of that. But at the end of the day, it hasn't prevented this attack from happening. Hmm. Well, what about a big park? Um, just throwing that out there. What about a nice big flattened park? How does that, how does that seem for everybody? Just, a, just an idea. Um, uh, so... Cori Bush, of course, the congresswoman, she came out and she's the latest Democrat calling for peace on both sides as Hamas attack on Israel continues. She wrote, I'm heartbroken on the ongoing violence in Palestine and Israel, and I mourn the 250 Israeli and 230 Palestinian lives that have been lost today. Notice the equivocation. Uh, and the thousands injured following attacks by Hamas militants on Israeli border towns and Israeli military bombardment of Gaza. What the hell are they... What the hell are they supposed to do? What are they supposed to do? I don't know. Maybe they should just uh, hug a bunch of people in Gaza. Maybe that'll make everything better. Give them more money. Give them more free electricity. Give them more free water. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe, I don't know, give them, uh, do they have Netflix yet? Give them some Netflix. Maybe that will, cut, will, will really solve this one. The bombardment is just the beginning. This is going to go, if, if they, they handle this correctly, it's going to go a lot farther than that. Rashida Tlaib, of course, doesn't believe that. She says she wants to, she calls for an end to apartheid and U.S. funding of Israel. She says, I grieve the Palestinian first and Israeli lives lost yesterday, which is hilarious considering it was the Palestinians who launched the attack. Um, I am determined as ever to fight for justice where everyone can live in peace without fear and true freedom and rights and human dignity, blah, 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 blah. The path to that future must include lifting the blockade, ending the occupation, and dismantling the apartheid system, blah, blah, blah. Now, of course, you know anything about the history of this region, which she does not. You would know that's a nonsensical argument, but we don't have time to go through every bit of Middle Eastern history uh, today. Uh, New York City, of course, had a nice big rally, and it was a pro-Palestinian rally. Some Democrats were opposed to this, uh, but not all of them, of course. Here is a video from town hall writer Julio Rosas, uh, who showed a Palestinian supporter in New York. And uh, in a New York City, this is in our country, telling a crowd the media will tell you that yesterday's terrorists invaded Israel. But we know. Watch. The media will tell you that yesterday terrorists invaded Israel. Yeah, they will. But we know that actually what happened the oppressed people of Palestine broke out of the open air prison that they have been Yeah, good thing to clap the for. The House is telling all its mouthpieces to tell us a false story. But we know that the real terrorists is the Israeli state that has been murdering, massacring, yeah. separating of a video of the Israeli state raping women and kidnapping them uh, over the past 24 hours. Um, Palestinian supporters also marching in New York City. We have some uh, video of that. Uh, here they are going back at, by a diner. Uh, and uh, it's good to know. I mean, like, it's one thing to protest for Palestinian rights, and often that's a completely misguided sentiment considering the people doing it. It's another thing to do it right after these people broke out and murdered a bunch of people, a thousand people. Uh, in a country of 9 million, again, you probably heard this, but, you know, we're talking about dozens of 9-11s here if you want to make it a percentage of population. This is a really, really bad situation. It's one of the worst things uh, Israel has ever had to deal with, and that's saying something. This is supposedly, at least uh, according to a bunch of experts, the worst day for the Jewish people since the end of the Holocaust, which I remember was really bad. So the fact that we have to even put that in the same sentence is absolutely incredible. Um, now, the media calls the attack on Israel unprovoked. Yes, they do, and so do I. Um, but experts say 
That's historically inaccurate. This comes from the Huffington Post. And it's amazing. Look, I know some of this is clickbait nonsense. I know some of this is, hey, let's have a hot take and we'll get some clicks. I got it. But this is, of course, central to the worldview of the left to blame the country that has some sort of Western values, to claim uh, the, the country uh, of Israel is the evil one. This is what they do in every situation, and they do it over and over and over and over again. Harvard student organizations claim Israel entirely responsible for the Gaza attacks, which is weird. I guess they were raping themselves? A little uh, self-rape going on, apparently, in Israel. That's uh, a quaint little concept. Lawrence Summers, by the way, a Democrat, a guy who served in the Obama administration and very closely associated with Harvard, uh, decided to be as clear as day on this one. In nearly 50 years of Harvard affiliation, I have never been as disillusioned as, and alienated as I am today. The silence from Harvard's leadership so far, coupled with a vocal and widely reported student group statement blaming Israel solely, has allowed Harvard to appear at best neutral towards acts of terror against the Jewish state of Israel. I'd argue they look a lot worse than that. Uh, unlike President uh, Bakao's strong statement of support, for Ukraine after Putin's invasion and the decision to fly the Ukraine flag over Harvard Yard, or Dean Gay's powerful statement on police violence. As a, a, um, we have as yet, 48 hours later, no official Harvard statement at this time uh, of moral testing. Instead, Harvard is being defined by the morally unconscionable statement, apparently coming from two dozen student groups blaming all the violence on Israel. I am sickened. I cannot fathom the administration's failure to disassociate the university and condemn this statement. I very much hope appropriate statements from the university and college condemning those who launched terrorist attacks and standing in solidarity with its victims will soon be forthcoming. To be clear, Nothing is wrong with criticizing Israeli policy, past, present, or future. I've been sharply critical of PM Netanyahu, but that is very different from lack of clarity regarding terrorism. Uh, look, when Lawrence Summers, you've lost Lawrence Summers, you, you got a problem here if you're a Democrat. I want to go to the White House here in a second and talk to you about the response and maybe what caused all of this in the first place when it goes to the Biden administration. We'll talk about that next. Let me tell you about the Upside app. Upside is a great app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, dines out. You might be seeing your prices going up quite a bit, especially gas prices with what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, why not save some money? With Upside, you get cash back on every purchase. You can fight back against inflation. You can fight back against uncertainty in the world. And you can just save some money. To get started, download the free Upside app. You can use my promo code STU and get an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. Next, you can claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. You can then pay as usual with a credit card. You don't have to have some crazy system. You just pay as you normally would pay. You follow the steps in the ad uh, in the app and you get paid in comparison to credit card programs or, or loyalty programs. You know, you can see some benefits from them. But you're going to get about three times as much uh, when it comes to cash back with Upside. Upside doesn't sell your personal information to third parties. They know your information is a vital part of their trusted relationship with you. So check it out. It's the free Upside app. Download it now. Use the promo code STU. Get an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. An extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas using the promo code STU. Save some cash with Upside. The accusation is that Iran's posture, excuse me, the, that the U.S., your administration's posture towards Iran has helped contribute to this. I want to get you, give you a chance to respond. Well, there are two things here. First, with regard to the, uh, the funds that you mentioned um, that um, uh, were released to or were made available to Iran for humanitarian purposes uh, as part of uh, getting Americans back who are being held and detained in Iran. Let's be very clear about this. And it's deeply unfortunate that some are playing politics uh -huh. and so many lives have been lost uh -huh. and Israel remains under uh -huh. attack. Uh, the facts are these. No U.S. Uh, taxpayer dollars were involved. These were Iranian oh. resources uh, that uh, Iran had accumulated from the sale of its oil uh, that were stuck in a bank in South Korea. They have had from day one, under our law, under our sanctions, the right to use these monies for humanitarian purposes. Hey, guys, no, none of your U.S. tax dollars went directly to funding this. Isn't that, a, isn't that incredible? Now, we can't say that about COVID. Uh, but that's a whole uh, another situation. That is uh, Blinken uh, blabbing on on CNN about uh, how, uh, yeah, sure, we released the money to them. I mean, but hey, like, you know, 
What's the big deal? At least it wasn't your money. You didn't pay taxes uh, to go to them directly for this attack. So don't worry about it. Um, now, of course, the point is very clear with this. They can say they're using it for humanitarian reasons. Let's just say they had $100 they were going to spend on food. If you give them $100, they no longer have to spend their other $100 on food. They can spend that $100 on terrorism. And that's very easy for, in fact, it's been admitted by the, uh, the Iranian officials. Uh, of course, uh, that isn't enough to convince Antony Blinken, who's just honestly blabbing for his, his political life at this point. What do you say about the argument that money is fungible? So Iran may have known this money is coming and used other funds to help fund this attack that happened. Iran has, ha Iran has unfortunately always used and focused its funds on supporting terrorism, on supporting oh. groups like uh, like Hamas, oh. uh, and it's done that when there have been sanctions. It's done that when there haven't been sanctions, okay. and it's always prioritized that. And again, I come back to the proposition that from these funds have always been under the law, available to Iran to use for humanitarian purposes. Well, you had to do something to release them. We all know that. Secondarily, if they're always giving money to Hamas, maybe we shouldn't be coddling them. Maybe we shouldn't be negotiating with them at all under any circumstances. Maybe we shouldn't be pursuing fanatically like a child running face first into a glass window an Iran deal. I don't know. These are basic things that any idiot should be able to understand. But apparently in the White House, they can't. Now, if you were worried about what was going on as all of this was uh, happening in Israel, what was our administration doing? Well, don't worry. They were having a grand old barbecue. That's right. The White House is being blasted by some people who just don't care about barbecues for throwing a barbecue as war rage, raises, uh, in, uh, in, rages in Israel. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, sure, they're having a barbecue, but at least the president was right on top of this. As soon as it happened, no big deal. Uh, just about 12 hours later. Watch. I got up this morning. He started this at 7.30, 8 o'clock. My calls, Hamas terrorists crossing in Israel, killing not only Israeli soldiers, but Israeli civilians. Yeah, if you catch the timing there, because of the time differences, uh, 12 hours later. Although maybe they're just keeping him in regular time. Like if something happens on the opposite side of the world, maybe they don't tell him for 12 hours so the time zones don't confuse him. That's also a possibility here. Now, if you think, all right, um, well... Sure, uh, he was having a barbecue while it was going on, and he didn't know about it for 12 hours. But the question is, how intensely did he focus on it today? And he, he was incredibly intense. Uh, he all is, of course, being slammed by critics for calling a lid, meaning no more questions, no more events, no more coverage, uh, before noon today. So didn't even put in a few hours. Uh, he's done. He's done at 11.46 a.m. So were you, was your day done at 11.46 I am I'm curious. Um, A.G. Hamilton wrote about some of the failures, uh, I thought, pretty well on Twitter, and I wanted to highlight them. He said that the Biden administration has a lot to answer for here. Their entire approach to the region has been a failure. They restarted aid to Gaza without any conditions. They have continually enabled Iran, including with a recent deal that gave Iran $6 billion to fund the very types of attacks and missile stockpiles we saw used this week. Finally, they have downplayed and ignored the scandal of their administration being compromised by an Iranian influence operation that connects back to the Iranian government. That Iran uh, hostage deal was uh, no negotiated by Qatar, which, often, uh, which is where the Hamas leadership lives in luxury while planning terrorist attacks against innocent civilians. Does that sound like a good record to anybody? Is anybody proud of this? Is it, if you're on the left, are you proud of this? Are you proud of what your president has done? You want this guy back in here doing this again? Really? You think this... Well, it's unbelievable. Every hostile uh, regime in the world has decided now's their time to act. And we're supposed to believe this is some sort of coincidence. Is that it? This is the time. Suddenly, they're just all the all this horrendous stuff started. All of these attacks, all of these countries stepping up, puffing out their chest, going for that thing they've always wanted to go for all happening at the same time. And I guess we're just supposed to believe oh, roll the dice. Total chance, total coincidence, no big deal. I want you to, I honestly want you to do this yourself. Right now, I want you to try this on for size. Turn my stupid audio down for a second or pause the video. And I want you to actually take 30 seconds to try to explain the argument of the left here. Just try it. Think about it for a second. 
I guess the argument is that all of these things, all of these terrible things are all happening when we have an incredibly weak leadership in the White House. They're just all happening by coincidence. It's just, it's just a total roll of the dice. You imagine believing something like that? Really stop and try it because you get to the end of this, it's hard to understand. And of course, it's really under, hard to understand the left wing position on this anyway. Look, there are a lot of issues that we can have debates on. You know, you want to talk about the minimum wage. I think it's clear that the minimum wage is, screws up uh, economies uh, and should not be handled the way that it is. But people on the left disagree with me. And there's back and forth on that. And, you know, look, I can see their side. I can't see the side of arguing uh, for a, a group of people of which when polled, 90 percent of them say that violence against civilians is OK. When you have that group of people who then cheer in the streets as people break down walls and fly over them and fire rockets at people and then go through these walls or over them and go murder innocent civilians, kill women, children, grandmas, grandpas. There's no moral equivalence here, boys and girls. This isn't a close one. There's no other side of this. There have been, I'm sure, plenty of things we can talk about with Israel and the way they've handled certain circumstances. Of course, you can say that with any country. You can say it about it less often with Israel than most countries, first of all. And second of all, there's just no equivalence between what these Palestinians and Hamas in particular do. And remember, Hamas is in power in this area because the Palestinian people voted them in. It is absolutely unbelievable. And you have to ask yourself, is Biden the worst foreign policy president of all time? Is there a worst example? This was supposed to be his expertise. This was supposed to be the thing he was good at. They were like, oh, yeah, he can't do a lot of that other stuff, but he's great on foreign policy. Is he or is he the worst of all time? One of the things I'm going to ask Josh Hammer. He's coming up here in just a minute. So what if I told you they could help fight human trafficking before you even put on your pants in the morning? Kind of sounds great. Undertack isn't your typical men's boxers. They are made with modal, which is kind of like cotton, but it's way, way better. It's 50% more moisture wicking, uh, antibacterial, and it's way softer. Uh, Undertack stays in place with a sturdy yet comfortable extra wide waistband. And the fly design is brilliantly straightforward. You're going to like it quite a bit. Uh, Under Attack is durable. It's ultra light. It's fade resistant and it's shrink resistant. I got a few pairs of these things. I love them. Uh, the best part is they're almost 30% less than the competition. Some of these undies can get a little expensive. You want to try to avoid that. Plus, Undertack is going to donate a portion of the profits to multiple organizations fighting human trafficking. So go pick up a drawer full today. They're great. Undertack.com. U-N-D-E-R-T-A-C.com. Undertack. Undertack. Uh, undertack.com get 20% off site-wide when you use the code stew20 undertack comes with a satisfaction guarantee you're going to love this stuff and they're making a better the world a better place as well undertack.com uh, the code is stew20 joined once again by josh hammer he's the senior editor at large for newsweek he's also host of the josh hammer show be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast josh thanks so much for coming on i, I wish it was better circumstances Stu, it's a terrible, terrible time, obviously, but always a pleasure to join you at least. I appreciate that. Um, just let's start at the top. How did you hear about this and what was your immediate reaction to this uh, terrible, terrible series of events? Well, um, you know, my fiance is Israeli. She was born in Israel. Um, she lives here in Florida where I live, but most of her family is over there. And I, I heard from her and her her mother, my soon to be, to be mother-in-law, basically just after Friday night meal ended. So this was not just over Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, but it was also over a Jewish holiday known as Shemini Atzeret or, or Simcha Torah. And I, they have so much family in Israel that the, that the word traveled very quickly and it was very difficult to sleep. Uh, suffice it to say, um, Friday evening into Saturday morning, it was particularly difficult to go to 
shul on, on Saturday because this is supposed to be a very joyous holiday, actually. Simchat Torah is, is the celebration on the annual reading of the Torah, the Hebrew Bible. It's supposed to be a, a profoundly joyous occasion. I found it immensely difficult to try to dance and celebrate and sing and do many of the things that we are supposed to do. So that was an internal struggle I was having. But um, yeah, I, it just uh, very personal, obviously. My, again, my fiance's family is almost all over there. Her oldest brother lives in a town called Netivot, which is probably five or six miles at the most from the Gaza border, heavily pummeled in previous skirmishes with Hamas by rocket fire. So it was very personal, obviously. Uh, just a horrible situation. And, and like, I don't want to downplay the evil of firing a bunch of rockets at, a, at unarmed civilians on the other side of a border. But like, this really was a completely different level of this. I mean, we ha- it, this is one of the worst days in the history of the state of Israel. And uh, it's it's hard really to to understand the scope of all this. I don't think we know the whole picture yet. We don't. Uh, I don't think we do either. The death toll just gets higher and higher and higher. Um, It started at 70 double digits. It is now over a thousand. I mean, Stu, that is really difficult to describe, I think, for the viewers. Israel is a small country. It's a country of about 9 million people. 1,000, I mean, you could do the quick math if you want. We're we're, we're talking here, I mean, if you want to do kind of the 9-11 thing that I've heard some others talk about, 30, 40, 9, 11s, I, I mean, uh, by some quick back of the envelope math, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's unfathomable. And again, this was a coordinated, sophisticated land, sea and air invasion. It was not just firing a bunch of rockets and praying that Iron Dome, Israel's missile defense system catches most of them. It has roughly a 95 percent success rate. But I mean, I mean, they were in the terror tunnels. They were paragliding in. I mean, they, they came over by, by a boat, thousands of uh, the worst scum jihadists you can ever imagine in the streets going door to door pretending to be so I mean the details are just absolutely horrific and tragically like you said I think it's only going to get worse as we learn more before God willing it starts to hopefully get a little better yeah you know this is where I really struggle looking at this stuff Josh because we, we, we talk about political issues geopolitics all the time right and we see left-wing viewpoints on those issues and most of the time I disagree with them Usually, though, I can understand their side of the argument, right? Like, I can understand their side of the argument on the minimum wage. I think it's kind of stupid at times, but I can understand it. I don't understand the other side of this. Like, you have a bunch of people who consistently launch attacks on civilians in a country that is doing everything it can to maintain peace in this region. There is one side starting all this violence over and over and over again. And there's another side who's constantly just trying to push back and carve out this one little slice of land in the world. And yet the media is constantly on the other side, talking about apartheid, talking about open air prisons. It's just impossible for me to understand it. Can you shine any light on this for me? I I wish I could. I mean, I really wish I could. So look, I mean, I, I am willing to concede that there are some people who are fed up with this two-state solution talking point. They genuinely think that this is the best possible long-term ramification. There, there are multiple reasons why a two-state solution in Judea and Samaria, what most people refer to as the West Bank, there are multiple reasons why that will never work, and especially after the events of this week will never, ever work. But even hold that particular issue aside right now, we're not even talking about that. We're not talking about Mahmoud Abbas, who is the wildly corrupt kleptocratic leader of the Palestinian Authority in like the 18th year of his four-year term. And by the way, he's the moderate here. We're not even talking about the Palestinian Authority. We're talking about Hamas. People need to go and actually read the Hamas founding organizational charter. It is publicly available. I read it on my own podcast for my show that came out today. It's on the Yale Law Library. They say in bone chilling language exactly what Hamas exists for. It exists to annihilate the state of Israel, to murder every single Jew in the world, Adolf Hitler, Nazi Germany style. These are fanatical Islamists. They are completely indistinct from ISIS. I mean, they're really not. I mean, these are ISIS level atrocities here. So anyone who even deigns to try to have the thought of defending Hamas, that is a barbaric, an inhumane, a a, a grossly uncivilized argument that I think should not be accepted within the confines of polite society. And anyone who goes there to defend that stuff, I think really frankly should be ostracized beyond possible measure and ultimately ushered out of the realm of respectable society. 
so with that knowledge, and of course, that's all true. We all know that these these documents exist. These were these are really the beliefs of Hamas. They've, we've seen them act on this over and over and over again. Bring me back to 2005, because 2005, Israel decides they're going to pull out of this area. Uh, 2006, I believe it was, Hamas is elected as the leaders, again, of this region. How possibly do you continue with the plan of pulling out of this area when they're electing Hamas? Right. So this is this is the thorny problem is Hamas is actually wildly popular in Gaza. Now, I, I, I think that there probably are. I'm sure there are actually at least some people within Gaza who see the horrific quality of life that the government has given them. Recalls to back in 2005 when Israel withdrew from Gaza, which was an absolutely catastrophic decision, one of the worst decisions Israel has ever made in its entire history. But at the time and, and they went to great lengths to do this, by the way, they physically uprooted 10,000 Jewish settlers who were living there. They literally took the bodies out of Jewish cemeteries and, and they left all the infrastructure there for the Palestinian Arabs who, who who were living there to make what was referred to, they wanted it to be the Singapore of the Mediterranean. They left the greenhouses, they left all this beautiful infrastructure there. And over the subsequent 16 years, Hamas first defeated Fatah of the Palestinian Authority, the moderate faction in a very bloody civil war. Over the subsequent 16 years from 2007, the end of that civil war till 2023, every single dollar that has gone into Gaza has not been used at all to improve the lives of the Arabs living there. Instead, they have gone exclusively to build this horrific terrorist, jihadist, cancerous tumor that exists for no other reason than to suppress their own people and to try to kill all the Jews. That that is just the simple, blunt reality of the situation in in Gaza. And, you know, there have obviously been prior skirmishes, 2009, 2012, 2014, uh, 2019 to a lesser extent, even 2021, between the IDF and Hamas, the language that the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, the army has used in the past is mowing the grass or mowing the lawn, just going in, just trying to calm things down. The key point here, Stu, that's not going to cut it anymore. There, 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 there cannot be any more mowing of the lawn. This is a grossly, grossly unsustainable situation as the whole world has now seen. And the military, God willing, is going to have to go in and do what they should have done a long time ago, which is completely and utterly extirpate this cancer. And what I have called for, and I'm going to continue to push for, if anyone is listening, it's not my government, obviously, I'm an American, but I, I hope that Israel formally re-annexes Gaza, because that disengagement in 2005 was the original sin putting us in, in this entire situation. You wrote about this on, on Twitter, um, and I encourage people to go and, and read the entire thing, because, you know, there's a lot of people talking about this. There's not a lot of people with plans, and you, you have a pretty detailed plan of, of what you think should happen here. It, you know, and, and as you admit throughout, it's not going to be easy. This is there's a lot of ugliness that goes along with this. Um, can you kind of walk people through what the process looks like to try to correct the situation once and for all? Well, look, uh, it, it, it's deeply complicated by the fact that there is a massive hostage crisis as well in Gaza right now. They have over a hundred. Hostages, we think, is the number. Um, I, 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 by the way, that includes at least a dozen Americans, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken, um, among that hundred. Just absolutely horrific stuff there. So that massively complicates the situation. So right now, the tanks have not started rolling in yet. That's probably going to happen over the next 36 to 48 hours at the latest, if I had to guess. Right now, the focus has to be, and the focus already has been, on getting as many civilians out of there as possible. There's no easy way to do this, obviously. The Egyptian government holds all the cards here because Gaza has the border with Egypt there in the Sinai Peninsula. The president of Egypt, el-Sisi, has has previously historically worked to help reach ceasefires between Israel and Hamas, but he doesn't want the people of Gaza in his country for the same reasons that none of the Arab countries want the Palestinian Arabs in Gaza in their own country, which is that these are deeply brainwashed, radicalized people. I mean, uh, they don't want their their own fellow Arabs to go in there, but I think the United States is going to have to use as much carrot and stick diplomacy as possible, threaten to withhold foreign aid to Egypt unless they take in these civilians. Worst case scenario, and this really is worst case scenario, if there's no if, 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 there's, if there's no resolution there, then the tanks can basically start rolling in and you essentially force a refugee crisis on the border fence with Egypt, just thus kind of just severely forcing Egypt's hand before the world. So once that situation is settled, you're obviously going to have to try to go into the tunnels. Hamas has this elaborate terror tunnel infrastructure underneath Gaza to try to get as many hostages out as possible. That's going to cost Israeli lives. I mean, that is a very daring, dangerous operation, to put it mildly there. 
at that point, God willing, most hostages will somehow make it out alive and with as many civilians evacuated as possible. You're going to have to start blowing shit up. I'm sorry. I'm not I'm not I'm not sure if I'm, if, if I'm allowed to say that in that kind of colorful language. But you're really you're, really, you're going to have to start knocking down large swaths of the infrastructure there, because sadly, there is very little difference between Gaza itself and Hamas. What they do is they put all their infrastructure, the tunnels, the rocket launchers, the missiles. It is embedded deep inside this, the mosque, the schools. And um, tragically, Stu, it's going to get ugly. There are going to be civilians, tragically, who die under the laws of war. These civilian deaths are exclusively at the hands of Hamas because they use them as civilian shields. But the, the images I, I, are not going to, to be palatable. But unfortunately, I genuinely do think it is the only option at this point. And the key point here, Stu, is that if there's ever, ever going to be any peace between the Israelis and the Arabs here, Hamas stands in the way. They have to go. Yeah, I think that's the only answer. And there's just not these half measures can no longer go on. Uh, Josh Hammer, senior editor at large for Newsweek and host of The Josh Hammer Show. I'm, I'm sure we'll have you back on once the media turns on this, when, when the invasion, you know, the, the response actually starts and the media starts to make Israel out to be the bad guys. We'd love to have you back on to talk about that because, you know, that's coming. Josh, thanks so much for coming on the program. You bet. Thank you. Well, we talked about it this a little bit when it was rumored, but now it is official. RFK, has la- RFK Jr. has launched his independent bid for president, leaving the Democratic race against Joe Biden. Now, of course, he was getting killed in the Democratic race against uh, Joe Biden. It wasn't even close. Uh, so uh, that's part of the reason he's dropping out. Um, and uh, look, it's all fun and games with the RFK Jr. thing when he's in the Democratic primary. It's kind of fun to see the chaos. It's fun to see Biden uh, have to, you know, you see polls with, you know, RFK Jr. getting as much as 20 percent. It's, it's uh, embarrassing for the president. That's kind of fun, frankly. Now that he's an independent, it's really a different story because I'm not entirely sure I agree with this analysis, but many polling experts believe he will pull more people from the right than he will the left. And that's because he spent a bunch of time going on right-wing podcasts and trying to convince people that he's the guy to vote for. I get this from a lot of people that I talk to uh, who say, you know who I really like is that RFK Jr. Maybe he's not so bad. He is so bad. That I assure you from 100 million of his viewpoints, despite the fact that I agree with him on a few different things. He's pretty good on uh, Bitcoin stuff. I mean, he's got a newfound uh, appreciation for border security, which I don't believe at all. Uh, And, you know, uh, while we don't agree on this topic overall, uh, I am also opposed to vaccine mandates. So there's some things to like about RFK, but it's overwhelmed by all the terrible stuff. And now he may pull more voters from the right, a Trump presidency, perhaps, than uh, a uh, Biden one. Then add on to this inexplicable decision that RFK Jr. is going to speak at CPAC. I don't know why CPAC would want to give a guy a forum who might be pulling votes away from whoever the Republican nominee is and hurting the conservative movement. It doesn't make any sense. He's not a conservative. He's anything but. Uh, This guy is, uh, despite the fact you might agree with him on a couple things, uh, believe me, he is no conservative. I don't know why he's at CPAC, but I don't know. My advice, don't vote for the dude. You, we highlighted some of the mainstream media coverage. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. I can tell you, now is the time you need something like Blaze TV. If you're not a member, it would be great to subscribe. I know we have some huge guests coming on this week. There's a lot going on with the news. And this, you know, it, it even seems okay for the mainstream media coverage at this point. Wait until Israel really kicks this into gear. They're going to turn on them so fast, and you're going to need the truth. It's going to be hard to find. BlazeTV.com slash stew. The promo code is Stu. You'll save 10 bucks off your subscription to Blaze TV. We really encourage you to join.